Peches Bov Metzia Daf Chavov Omud Beis in the bottom of the page. In the bottom of the page, we are about to start restart the new Mishnah, which we saw about finding stuff in the shop. Now we're this year's Lerfuas Imi Maros in the Chama Bas Chanam Ala Norman Crow Lebastam Moshmuda Von Ben Yudis Yudis Bas Rivka Nina Chaya Bas Gula Ochel. Oven Yako Ben Gold, Esther Gabriela Batso, Hanna Batsima Tomo, Basnovi Belazis, Lin Baba Tales, Bels, Ben Denis Shalos, Benin, the Yako of Amen, Soya Labachira, the Illunishmas of Emir Menachem and Akiva, Rus, Basholem, So, Bas Moshe. Says the Mishnah, Rotso Bechanut, a person found money in a shop, or could be other items too. So, Hare Elu Shaloi. Says uh, Rashi, the reason why, if you find money in the shop, it's yours, because everybody goes into the shop, right? The item has no simon, says Rashi, right? Since the item has no shim, simon, and the shop is hopefully successful and is full of people and different people come, or even not so successful, but different people come all the time. La Maisa in that shop, yeah, if you find something, thank you, in the area where the customers are, then what do you have to do? You do not have to return. You can keep it. That's Rashi. Tosus argues with Rashi. And Toysfus says, the last Toysfus in the page, says Toysfus, even if the item has a simon, yeah, nevertheless, it does make a difference because most people are going. We're talking in a place where most people are going. And in that case, Rabbi Shimon ben Elozer is right. In a case where most people are going, even if you know that it fell from a Jew, you still don't have to return it. You know that the Jews are the one who lost it because you saw a bunch of Jews coming there. Yeah, if you have seen him, but most people that are not Jewish, then you don't have to return it because the Yudin were Miyash. That's Toysus. There's a third cheetah of the, of the few other Rishon which I've seen, and they say even if the majority are Jews, you don't have to return, even if there is a Simon. You know why? Is, was it the Ritva? Listen to this beautiful Svara. Was it the Ritva? Or one of the Rishonim says, listen to this. You're in a shop and you found something in the shop where the customers are, in the customer's area, when you walk around and you buy the stuff, even if the item has a semen, and even if the item is lost in a, in a, a predominantly Jewish area, you don't have to return it. Oh, why? What, what happened to Ashava Saveda? Says the, I saw it last night, Ritva, I think. He says something very cool. He says, to find something in the shop is the worst place area. Why? The worst place possible to lose something is in a shop which is frequented by many people, but owned by one person. Why? The one who may have found it is a shopkeeper. Yeah? Okay? He go, if the person loses it, he went back to the shop. He, he lost it and went back to the shopkeeper and says, where's my stuff? And the shopkeeper says, I don't know. It's very easy for the shopkeeper to say, I don't know, and to say that other people took it. Well, really, he's the one who possibly took it. And the person, that's why the person gives up hope. Because on one hand, you know, the shopkeeper can play the dumb and say easily, you know, even if he really took it, he can say it's a big shop and, you know, I don't know who took it. And that's why the person is Miyash. So according to those Rishonim, even in that, even in that situation of yes, Simon, and no, and, 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 and mostly uh, Jewish people, still, you don't have to give it back. However, Rashi doesn't say that. Rashi says that there's no Simon. In any event, we're talking here about the area of the shop. You imagine yourself a shop, all this shop, like imagine yourself a pharmacy. Pharmacies today, I think, are the places where it's very clear, or maybe even a supermarket, right? You have like, a, you know, where you put your stuff, you put the bags with the, with the goods, right? And, you know, the thing goes, the, yeah, then you pay, and the cashier is on the other side, okay? So in a regular olden days shop, you have this customer's area. Then you have in the middle, you have the shulchan. You have some kind of table counter. And then behind that, you have the person standing and serving you, which would be like today, the pharmacist, the seller, whoever. So back to the Mishnah. Matzah b'chanus, whatever you found in the shop, we're talking in the customer's area where people walk around, the customer's the clients. They belong to the finder, and I already explained why. Because the owner is miyash, either no simon, or yes, simon, but don't trust the shopkeeper. Ben ateva v'lechenveni. If you found the money between the teva, the teva is the counter, is, by the way, back then the counter was, it's very much like today in the pharmacy, is not so much anymore, you know, that under the counter, over the counter, under the counter, you know, in the box, in that teva, in that box, the chenveni would have goods that would be for sale, like in jewelry shops, that's where they have it, right? You know, like a jewelry shop, like it's, they have this pane, and the table itself has like a section where the goods are inside, 
and he takes it from there, and you pay him over there. That's the teva. So bein a teva v'chenveni between the counter and the and the shopkeeper. If you found money over there, you sneaked into there, and you found money over there. Shel chenveni, they belong to the chenveni, and according to Sami Shonim, he doesn't have to give you a simon because we assume that money that fell over there belongs to him. It's money that he received from the people or money that he had. It's his uh, step only terrain, and therefore it belongs to him. Now continues the Mishnah, Lifnei Shulchani. Continues the Mishnah to talk about a Shulchani. What's a Shulchani? Money changer, Bureau de Change. It's a money changer, it's a banker. And now the same thing. If he found it, Lifnei Shulchani. By the way, notice the differences. He doesn't say Bachanut, it says Lifnei Shulchani, but it means the same thing possibly. Lifnei Shulchani means the area of the, what you call it, of the money changer where people are. You go to the Merkaz, it's a rather large area. One of them where the people just come, they stand, they walk in, the walk-in area where the people come and wait in line to be served. The money that you found over there, you can find a lot of different currencies there, yeah? Japanese yen, euro, dollars, Canadian dollars, yeah? It belongs to you for the same reason. Whoever brought in money to that uh, no man's land, Hefker land, it belongs to the finder because the person, the owner was Meyash, Ben Akisev Shulchoni. Over there, the Shulchoni would have like a chair, and on that chair, he would have like a counter, more or less the same as the Chanut. If he found it between the actual money changer and the counter, meaning the staff only area, Shulchoni, belong only to the Shulchoni, as we said before about the shop. You may ask, what's the Chiddush? Why do we have to mention both a shop and a money changer? Soon you'll see in the Gemara that there's a big difference. Continues the Mishnah, yeah, in the middle. Alokeach Peros Mechaveroi. If somebody got, uh, he bought fruit from his friend, you buy fruit from best market, but fruit from, uh, I'm done doing, uh, you know, uh, commercials over here from wherever, Zol Begadol. Alokeach Peros Mechaveroi. You bought fruit from your friend and it arrived by delivery as we tend to do all the time in this neighborhood. Or let's say his friend sent him fruit, could be as a gift. He found money all of a sudden between the cucumbers and the tomatoes. Oh, surprise. He found a, a crumpled, a few crumpled notes of what? Of $100. That's nice. He found money in there. They belong to the receiver of the delivery and not the shopkeeper. And not the whoever the farmer. Of course, the question is why. The Gemara will explain why. But they belong to you because you don't know who it came from. In other words, this money has no semen. The money has no semen. So you say, ah, of course, if there's no semen, they belong to, to me because there's no semen. However, why shouldn't we say they belong to the shopkeeper or the farmer, right? Because he's the last station where it came from. They'll be discussed in the Gemara, okay? Let's say that money that you found between the cucumbers and tomatoes. Oh, wow. They are tzruin. They are bundled up. They are tied in an island bag, in an envelope or something. And there is a siman. Yeah, in other words, it's a red envelope with a little blue butterfly in the corner. It can definitely be identified. Then you have to be machriz and you have to find out who's the owner. Very good. Says the Gemara. Yeah. Omar Rabbi Elozo. Rabbi Elozo, now, I don't know if you noticed, but the Mishnah kind of tricked us. <laughs> the Mishnah only spoke about, I thought of drawing a chart. It's, you don't have to draw a map over here. Uh, it's, it's, it's too easy for that. The shop has two areas, right? There's a shop where the people are waiting in line, walking around, buying their stuff. And there is a staff only area between the counter, counter, you say, right? Not counter, counter and the person serving. Oh, what about the actual counter? What happened if I found some money, loose money there, or other objects, yeah, on the actual counter? The Mishnah kind of ignored that. What do you say then? Because both people have access to that area. That's where the exchange is actually taking place. What's going to be there? Says the Gemore, Omar Belozor, Belozor is going to take care of business, excuse the pun. Omar Belozor, Afilu Munochin al Gabi Shulchon, even if the belong, even, excuse me, even if the money was placed, you found it on the actual Shulchan, on the actual uh, table, then they belong to who? To the finder. Yeah? If you find it on the shulchan of the, who? We're going to see, of the shulchani, they belong to the finder. On the actual counter, where the money is being changed, that is if you found it in the big part of the store, in the client's area, 
and over there, you can keep it to yourself. And you can ask why, but first we're going to prove it, question it, and then we're going to explain the Svara, which is mentioned by the two. Tnan says the Gemara trying to bring a proof to who? To Rabbi from the Mishnah. Read the Mishnah again. No, I'm not telling you to read the Mishnah again. The Gemara is reading the Mishnah again, saying, Tnan, it says the Mishnah. Which means, if you find something, it's very misleading. Doesn't mean the air, the step only area. means in the client's area, where you walk into the shop and you wait in line and you read the notices, whatever. That area they belong to who? To the finder, because that's a Hefker belt area. Huh? So now let's be medayik from there. Let's derive the information from there. Al gabe shulchan, the shulchani. That is to say, only if it's really far from the guy, when it's the client's area, they belong to the finder. Mashma, what's the next area that's close to it? The actual table, the actual counter, and then they belong to the banker, they belong to the money changer. That's the duke that we can be medayik from the Mishnah. However, aim a seifa, read the seifa. Look at the second part of, of the statement. What does it say over there? If you found it in the staff only area between the counter and the actual guy, the banker, only there they belong to the shulchani, it belong to the banker. That is, from here I can derive just the opposite. From here, Midak, just the opposite. Oh, that is to say, Mashma, if you find it on the counter, they belong to the finder. Get, get what's going on here. If the Mishnah told me, that in the st- in the in the client's area they belong to the client. Mashma on the table, they belong to the to the banker. And then she says, no, if you find it in the banker's area, they belong to the banker. Ah, so if it's on the table, it belongs to the to the client. So what's going on with the table? Ella, therefore, we give in meha from our Mishnah, Lekala Mashma Mino. From our Mishnah, we cannot derive anyway. The Mishnah is not being very precise, and some Mishnahs are on purpose to explain many times that Mishnah on purpose, you should know. It's not exactly the most uh, precise and exact text because the Mishnah, they had to read it in certain ways, they had to uh, memorize it, made it easy for the Talmudim to remember. So the Mishnah remains sometimes obscure. So from the Mishnah, you cannot, uh, you cannot prove Rabbi Loza right or wrong. Remember, what did Rabbi Loza say? He go to the money changer and he found money on the actual table, then it belonged to the finder. We assume it came from the outside world, from the clients, yeah? And if you find it there, it's as if you found it in the actual client's area, in the big part of the shop, in the walk-in area, right? That's what the Belozer says. However, from our Mishnah, we can't derive any information either way. The Mishnah is even almost contradicting itself, but definitely the Mishnah is not helping us to understand Rabbi Lozer. So now, Frank the Gemara, okay. If so, Rabbi Lozer, ho minale. <laughs> so how did Rabbi Lozer come up with that idea? Minole, how does he know? Rabbi Lozer, where in the Mishnah did Rabbi Lozer see the fact that he claims that if you find the money on the actual table, on the counter, it belongs to the finder. Who told Rabbi Lozer that's true? Says the Gemara, Omar Rove. Rabbi says that although we, we were not medak from the Mishnah, but Rabbi Lozer was. How? Omar Rove, Masnisin Kshite. Rabbi Lozer had a kushia. He had difficulty with the Mishnah that led him to say what he said. What's the question? My area, the tiny benekis le shulchoni shel shulchoni. Why do you say? Why did the Mishnah say that if he found it between the chair, which means the counter, and the actual banker, it belongs to the banker? Why did we constrict it to that area? Why didn't you maximize the, the, the chidush and say litni ala shulchan also? He should also teach me. The Mishnah should have told me that if he found it on the table, even then it belongs to the shulchoni. The Mishnah didn't say that. The Mishnah basically minimized it to only talk about the staff area, not about the table. Mashma, that if it's on the table, it belongs to the finder. Inami, and here comes another proof from the Mishnah, and that's the punchline, and that would make a big difference to Halofa. Another, another source for a blozer to say that if you find it on the counter, it belongs to who? It belongs to the finder. Motso b'shulchonois I think over here, inami which means, as I told you, the Mishnah did not use exactly the same lotion for a shop 
and for Shulchani. And here comes the big difference. Here they start to to uh, to deviate from each other. Basically, in the when he talks about Chanut, what's a Chanut? A shop. You buy cheese, you buy socks, you buy computers, you buy whatever you buy, the regular shop. It's not a money changer. And there we spoke about an area called Chanut. What's Chanut? Chanut is clearly only the area where shop, where shop, where the shoppers, where the customers come. Customers, yeah? He, when it comes to Shulchani, we didn't say that. The lotion we used in order to say that the, 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 the way we describe the area of Hefker, where it belongs to you if you find it, was not Shulchanut. It should have been Shulchanut. Should have been the shopkeepers, the, the money changers area where people walk around. We didn't say that. What did we say? We said instead of that, Motza Lifne Shulchani. Ah, Lifne Shulchani, that is to say, greater area. In front of the Shulchani means not only in the area where it is, what, where people walk in, also closer to the Shulchani also belongs to the people. Lifne Shulchani. Lifne Shulchani. I think maybe I'll, I will make a chart. Maybe I will make a little... Uh, no, I don't have the whiteboard. I don't have time to take it. Maybe I'll show you later. Yeah, you get what I'm saying? Again, the, the Gemara says as follows. When we spoke about a shop, we said, you know which area of the shop you should keep it to yourself in an area called Chanut. Chanut is clearly only the area where the shoppers, the customers are allowed to walk around and that's normal for them to be there. Not anywhere else. Only there... We say it belongs to the finder because the money was Yush and Hefker. When it comes to Shulchani, we say no. We say Lifnei Shulchani. Any area in front of the Shulchani, meaning including the counter itself, also belongs to the finder. El Shmamin. I'll say the Shmamin and I'll tell you this, Laura. Therefore, must be Shmamin. Now we hear from that. When it comes to Shulchani, even though from those two proofs from the Mishnah, says Rabbi Loza, we can prove that even the no man's land or everyone's land, the counter where both hands are exchanging stuff there, in that area too, it belongs to the finder and not to the Shulchani. While by the shop, it's different. But the shop itself, shop where you buy anything else but money, yeah, over there we say that if you find something in the counter, Belongs to who? To the shopkeeper. And the question is, of course, why? So I saw the tour. I saw somewhere that directed me to the tour. Yeah. In other words, let's summarize. Let's summarize. A staff only area by both banker, money changer, and any other shop. It's the same. What's behind the counter, between the counter and the actual person, the shopkeeper, the seller who sells whatever, sells you a part in the moon, whatever, then what belongs to the shopkeeper? The client area, which is where all the clients and all the shop the shoppers that walk around belongs to the shopper because the person was Miyaj. What about the in-between area? What about the actual counter, the actual table between them? Then depends. We seem to have a difference over here. When it comes to the Shulchani, it belongs to the finder. When it comes to the regular shop, it belongs to the shopkeeper. And of course, the question is why? And the answer is very, very easy. The answer is sort in the tour. <laughs> and funnily enough, after sort in the tour, sort in the Ramach. One of the Rishonim. Yeah, it should be the other way. Says the two, and before him the Ramach, he says like this. It's very, very easy. It's a very easy story. It's very practical. When you bring, we, we assume that the item found, let, let's talk about shops now. You found an item in the shop, but it, not necessarily money. You found something, I don't know, a pen. You found a pen in the shop, okay? Has simon, no simon, but going. You found a pen in the shop. Nice looking pen. Hey, I'll take it to myself. When can I say I'll take it to myself? when it's either in the client's area, when they walk around, when they shop, or when it's on the table. You know why? When you come to a shop with a, with a pen, usually, yeah, you don't put the pen on the counter. Why should you? Sometimes, very rarely, but you don't put your stuff that you bought from before from different shops or stuff you bought from home, you have no reason to put it on the counter. And therefore, in that case, we assume it doesn't belong to the finder because it didn't come from the outside world. It's the shopkeeper's. The shopkeeper does sometimes give put this stuff over there. People used to live in the shops in the times of the Gemara. Also in Spain, in some areas, even till today, they live like behind the shop, maybe in other countries too. Now, when it comes to money changer, no. <laughs> of course you put your money 
you, Mr. Client, Avada, you put your money on the counter. Of course, Avada, that's what you came there for. You didn't come to just share the news with him and put your yellow cheese there. You put your money there. You put the dollar, it gives you shekels. You put the yen, it gives you yuan. Right? That's what it's all about. And who are more, the people or the shopkeeper? Of course, the people are more than the shopkeeper. Email, like Stoltz said before about the, the meat market in Yerushalayim, email, we say it comes to the shopkeeper, then it's different. Money found with the shop, no, excuse me, by the by the, by the the Shulchani, the money changer, even money found on the actual counter, on the table, is assumed to belong to the customers who gave up hope and lost hope, and Yush, and therefore you can take it. But the shop, if you find some foreign object on the counter, then we assume it belongs to the Balabais to the shopkeeper, and it belongs to him in no argument. And that's about it. Continue. Wow. Says the Gemara, yeah, yeah, what did we say at the end of the Mishnah? Somebody took fruit, which means he bought fruit from his friend. Yeah, are you friendly with a, with a vegetable store owner? Good. What did we say? He found money conveniently, you know, cashed between the tomatoes and the peppers, and then it belongs to you. When is that true? That belongs to you because there's no simon. Which means, if you bought it from Mr. Best Market, if you bought it, what's the tagal? The soicher, the merchant. You bought it from the greengrocer. You say greengrocer in America? Yeah. Yeah, you bought it from the greengrocer, you bought it from the tagal, the one who sells it. And where did he buy it from? From the farmer. Today, it goes through even more hands, right? In other words, when I got the, the box with the, with the vegetables, yeah, and we assume that that box has been through more than one hand. Get what I'm saying? It's been through more than one pair of hands. I bought it from the shopkeeper, who in return bought it from the wholesaler, who may have bought it from who? From Mr. A farmer. Yeah, Farmer Jake. Then we say, well, there's no semen. <laughs> it's been through a few hands. Gave ace. How do you know who's the owner? Email, I'll keep it to myself. It's been through uh, many. Yeah, it started in the Golan somewhere. Went to the Beta Riza, this and that. Now it came to me. I'll keep it, says the Mishnah. <laughs> but if you got it from the Balabais, Let's say you get directly from the farmer, you get the produce, and the only person who actually dealt with it before you, it's a one-man operation called Mr. Farmer, then what? You have to give it back to him, even though there's no semen. Why? Because if I see money falling off the, off the pocket of Yosef, Yosef, if I saw money coming out of your pocket, I would quickly run and give it back to you. Trust me. I, there's no semen, but I know it came from you. There's no other person in the room, right? Or let's say I see a person coming into the room. I check the room is empty. <laughs> the room is completely empty. No objects over there. No money. The chosen kala came in. They come out. And you see some money over there. Of course it belongs to them. They're the only option. Who cares? There's no simon. There's the only one, 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 one option yeah, of who the owner is. And therefore, if you bought it straight from the, from the producer, from the farmer, you have to give it back to him. The chen tani tana kameder of Nachman. And also there was one amoyer. Don't get that wrong. There's an Amoira, like I told you a few days ago, an Amoira who taught a Brisa in front of Rav Nachman. He told him a Brisa. And what does the Brisa say, the Brisa that was taught in front of Rav Nachman? Loishna, it's not what the mission is only true. If you bought it from the merchant, who in return bought it from other people before him, and you don't know who the owner is, then the Mishnah says, keep the money. No semen. It's been through a few hands. Take it. But if you took it straight from the farm, straight from the person himself, yeah, my mother, by the way, there was a time, my mother, uh, for health reasons, we used to uh, get milk from a, from, a, from a farm, it used to come straight from that farm into a different home. They would produce very, very natural milk. Yeah. So sometimes even today they do it. So then you have to give it back. Omer Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman comes and challenges the Brisa challenges the b'risa that we just read. And he's asking a good question. You're saying it came from Mr. Farmer. You think Mr. Farmer is the one-man operation? Did he dash is to thresh, right? So Ladush. Is he the only one who threshed it? Is he the only one who actually dealt with it by himself? Impossible. Every farmer has to have a few workers, and therefore back to square one. You're telling me 
that what did we just say? There's no semen on the money that came between the vegetables, right? In the in the mishloch in the delivery. But if it came from the guy, from the farmer himself, he'll give it back to the farmer. Mapitom, how do you know it belongs to the farmer? The farmer may have five, 10, 15, 20, or 100 workers. Yeah, he didn't do it all on his own. It's impossible to do all the field works on your own. So you don't know which Jewish worker belongs to, right? So again, it's wrong. Omar Lay, so now the Amora who quoted the Raisa, challenged Rav Nachman, he asked him, Ismay, shall I erase that Raisa? Wow. As I told you, we see it again what we saw a few days ago. The Brises are volatile. The Amoroim have to approve of the Brisa or disapprove of it. Yeah. So he's asking Rav Nachman, Rav Nachman, shall I erase that Brisa? Is that Brisa so illogical and wrong? Because it doesn't make sense that I'll, that I'll give it back to the farmer. We may have 10, 1,500 workers. So maybe the Brisa is downright wrong. The Brisa is really something which I heard from a wrong source. Omar Lay, no, 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 says Rav Nachman, we can salvage the Brisa by explaining the Brisa as follows. You should explain the Mishnah the following way, or the Brisa. The Brisa has a way of survival. We can explain the Brisa that this person, we happen to know, we happen to know that this farmer has Goisha workers not Jewish workers that are, the Shabbat Veda doesn't apply. He has his own Ebed Veshiv, his own slaves and maidservants, which are Knaini. So all the money that they own is really owned by him. Maybe the children also work there, also owned by the father, right? The Chule. The wife's money many times belongs to the husband. Because it's a family business and the only workers are Ebed Veshiv that are Gentile, and mainly the money belongs to the owner. So at the end of the day, there is only one ownership. You can have 50 people working there, but financially speaking, it's one body. It's one financial body called Mr. Farmer Jake himself. And in that case, you do have to return the money because you know it belongs to him and to him. Because everybody else in the farm is really under his financial authority. Thank you. Yes. I'm with you. There's the next Mishnah. Half a similar, now that Mishnah, by the way, a small introduction, that Mishnah is very different to any other Mishnahs we've seen so far in this Perek. This Mishnah talks about the source in the Torah. We're going to analyze the Psukim, yeah, break down the Psukim that tell us that one must return in the Veda, lost object, yeah? It's going to tell us all kinds of rules that we learn from the actual Psukim. As an introduction, I'll tell you, that we all know very, very well. Obviously, the Torah doesn't just, you know, uh, spend words. There's no redundant words in the Torah. And the Torah, when he talks about a Shavas Aveda in different places, more than once, more than twice in the Torah, the Torah tells you, gives you four examples for items that are lost. Yeah? A donkey, a bull, a set, which is sheep, and a simla, which is a garment. It's not only a dress, it's a garment. And it screams to high heaven, why does the Torah have to tell me four different examples? The Torah could have said, you found something, give back the something. Why is the Torah telling me and giving me four, no less than four different examples of items that I have to return? Well, obviously I have to return any item. But do I really have to return any item, by the way? No. Some items I don't have to return. For example, something that has no semen. Yeah. Right? Let's say there is no semen to the item, and I know the person already enough time passed that it was Miyash, right? And there is no semen, I don't have to give it back. For example, or another thing I don't have to return, let's say something that is not worth one pruta. We discussed it also yesterday. I find an item that's really, I find uh, some tiny piece of bread. Mamish, uh, less, not a morsel, a few crumbs. They're not Shavet Pruta. They're not even worth 10 agarot, right? Nobody would buy it for 10 agarot, even a homeless person. Mimela, I don't have to return it. So there are certain standards of what I have to return and what I don't have to return. And we somehow learn it from those four examples, okay? We're ge beginning to get the picture, so now it's time to read the Mishnah. Says the Mishnah. The Simla, the dress which is not only addressed, the garment mentioned in the Torah as an example, was included in kol elu, which means 
the Torah says, it says in the Torah, b'chen ta'ase l'chol abed ha'sachicha. It's even worse. It says, you should do so to return to any lost object of your friend. And yet it says in the Torah, b'chen ta'ase l'chol abed ha'sachicha. And also do it to his garments. The lama yotzos. Why did the Torah exclude, so to speak, why did the Torah speak out the simla, the garment? Why? It's, 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 it's just like any other object. Says the Mishnah, lehaki shalea to compare all other objects to the simla. to tell you. Ma simla miyuchedes, there's something unique about a dress or any garment, that sheyesh basimonim veyesh latoivin, which means a garment is always manufactured by what? Actually, today it's not so true, but a, a garment is used to be all hand done, and every garment would be different. We think we live in such an individualistic world, the Western world, Everyone buys the same T-shirt, uh, which is mass-produced in millions from uh, wherever, from Zara, from I don't know, whichever shops come to mind. Yeah, it's all the same. But in the real good old days, each person would have a simon on his dress or in his uh, garment, on his shirt. Why? Because it's handmade. So uh, Rashi says differently. Rashi says a simla is not something made directly by Kodesh Baruch Hu. It's not naturally made like an apple. You can say all green apples look alike. But the dresses, they don't look alike because they're made by human beings. So each one makes it differently. So there's a simon in it. The yeshla toivin, also a simla, is something which, again, because it's not from healthcare, a simla is always owned by someone. An apple growing on the tree may not be owned by anybody, right? Right? You go to the wilderness, you go out of town, you see apple trees possibly not owned by anybody. A dress, a garment, pants, trousers, they're always owned by someone. So someone would be toiver. What's toiver? Someone would claim it. Everybody would claim their, their garment, unless they were mafkir. So just like simla has two qualities, it has simonim, and it's owned by someone who wants to get it back, usually. So too, when it comes to, let's say, food. Oh, here's a good example, Baruch Hashem. Let's say it comes to fish. Oh, then not all fish are owned by people and not all fish are different, right? Right? So if I stop see a fish swimming, <laughs> I don't have to return it to anybody. There's no semen and possibly no owner. Only something that has a semen, let's say a fish that's cut like a triangle, right? We said, or a fish that's, you know, stringed with money, uh, other fish in a specific number, right? Or weight. Those kind of fish have a semen and have an owner after a turn. Says Rashi something which I did not tell you. Says Rashi, from here we also learn about Yush, which means if something has no toiv in, let's say there's a very specific looking uh, pair of uh, shoes, yeah, which can definitely be identified. They're black with a silver thing with a brand name. But if I walk down the street and I know the person was Mayash, I heard the owner before I came. I wasn't tricking. I wasn't uh, like the bad guy from yesterday. I'm an honest guy. As I walked down the street, I heard somebody from the yeshiva saying, oh, those shoes with the black thing, I gave up on them. I, I looked for them for weeks, I didn't find them, and I find it. Although they have a simon, very specific simon, but I know the owner lost hope, I can take it. Why? That we also learn from simla, because it has no toivim. There are no, how do you say, claimants. Nobody claims it. Nobody claims it back. Mimela, I can take it. So from simla, we learn it has to be something identifiable and something that is claimed and wanted by the owner. That's, that's what Simon has brought down to minimize and tell me that things that are not with Simon and not with Tovim, I don't have to return. Says the Gemara, now, my Bechlal kol elu. The Gemara says, what did the Mishnah mean? When the Mishnah said the word Bechlal kol elu, included in, in all these. What do you mean all these? Amarave, we're talking about a pasuk over here. Bichlal included in Kol Aveda Sachicha. It's included in the Pasuk. It says in the Pasuk, anything your friend loses. So obviously, a dress is, is included or any other garment. That the Mishnah said, yeah, the garment comes actually to minimize, to exclude things that have no simon and have no claimants. Omar Rove. Oh, now Rove goes into, I you say Rove's going to have a field day. Now Rove goes into a, 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 um, examining all four examples, not only the one example of Simla, the other three examples, and we have to know why the Torah chooses them and what does the Torah want to learn from them. Omar Ove, 
Lamali the Kosav, Rahmano, who's Rahmano? The Toiro in Hashem. Rahmano is Hashem, the Toiro, the merciful one. Is that what the right to know? It's called the merciful one. Anyway, mercy on me. Yeah, why did the Torah write Shor Chamor Se Vesimla? Why did the Torah have to use four different examples to tell me about items that have to be returned? Says Rava, don't worry, Tzrichi. Yes, you need all four. Why? Because of Rahmano Simla. Let's say the Torah would have written Simla only. Yeah, it's one example. Hava Amina, I would have thought, Han Mili Be'edim De Gufa the Simon in the Gufa, which means, I don't go into it now. You know, I, I'm going to skip what I wanted to say. I'll just say in short. One would have thought, when I have a dress or trousers or pants or any kind of uh, lavouche, yeah, where is the mark in the actual item, right? The item itself. Yeah, it's a size 16 uh, shirt, whatever, size 19 and a half, with a little uh, stain over there, right? That's in, in the body of the shirt. Right? I have a simon. But let's say the shirt is white. It's a very good simon, right? In yeshiva. No, not a good simon. Or witnesses. I'm going to explain later why did the Gemara give an example of Edim. I'll leave that for now. Aval, however, chamor, donkeys don't always have a simon. Sometimes, I'm not such a big donkey, mumcha, yeah? But Lemaisa, many times donkeys look more or less the same. The Edim, the Ukaf, Ah, you know what's an ukaf? What's an ukaf? Saddle. Oh, the simon in the ukaf. Let's say a guy lost the donkey and another person found the donkey and they got in touch. Comes Mr. Donkey Owner or supposedly donkey owner and says he gives you very good simon in the saddle. It tells you the saddle had what? Red strings and blue strings and the... Uh, flag of Jordan. I've never seen so many donkeys in one day. Like when I was in Jordan, I've seen donkeys all the time, all around. Yeah. So then one would say, Ooh, wait a second. You're telling me a semen in the saddle that's on the donkey, but you're not identifying the donkey himself or itself. Yeah. So now maybe I won't give it back to you because maybe you lent it to somebody else. Maybe the saddle is yours and you lent it to your friend, to Mahmoud Abdul, and really the saddle is yours, but the donkey belongs to Mahmoud or belongs to Moishale. So maybe I wouldn't get it back to him because it's not in the body of the actual thing. It's an adjacent thing. Remember? Remember when we learned about fruits next to a cup, next to a basket? It wasn't so simple, right? So one would claim and say, maybe if you have an ukaf and a chamor, a saddle and a donkey, maybe the saddle would not be good enough of a siman to the set to the chamor that it's accompanying, comes the Torah and tells me no. Because the Rahman Chamor, the Torah tells me donkey the filo chamor besimona ukaf to tell me that the chamor with the signs with the simon with the identification marks of the ukaf can be returned. Why well, can I ask why? And I'll tell you that I saw in I think the some sefer somebody quoted tomorrow later, which honestly I don't remember, is that many times the chamor is not used for a different ukaf. I don't know, I have to ask people and go horseback riding. In other words, when you give put a saddle on a on a horse, it's not used to it, it's not good for the other uh, not good for the other chamor or the other uh, they do it today in farms, they do change them all the time. But maybe when you have your one favorite chamor, he's always used to the same saddle. The wrong saddle for the wrong chamor is not so commonly switched around because it can cause them, I think, um you no know, the scratches. Yeah, okay, I have to ask a donkey owner, but of course I believe the Gemara. And Mimela, we say that the Chamor with the Nukaf is believed. I just want to point out something before I ask you a question, and that is, I promised you, the Gemara mentioned besides Simonim, which are Simonim, which are identification, also Edim. Why did we talk about Edim? Because there's an opinion later that says that Simonim, Midoraisa, are not enough. You may have to bring witnesses that this is your Ukaf. But we'll talk about that tomorrow. Hopefully we'll get there tomorrow. That's not the issue right now. Okay, you can still ask questions. Yes, yes, Ferris. Question time, Marshall. Weiter. Okay, Weiter. Okay, let's continue. Now, so we're okay with the dress and we're okay with the chamor. Now, Frek the Gemara Weiter, Shor Veset, the Kos of Rahmono, Lameli. Line starts with the letters Lamed Lamed. Why did the Torah have to write a bull and a sheep? Why? Why? That's already extra. Answers the Gemara. Show the Afilo Legizas Znovoi. 
Shol comes to tell me, here comes the Mechlokes Rashi Tois first, even for the, for cutting or shearing, cutting the end of the tail of the bull. The bull doesn't have a nice tail like the, the, like the sheep, yeah, like an alia, but the bull does have a tail, and in the tail you have like a small schwanz at the end, yeah. So now, says Rashi, even if you just found the small item, you found that lit, a few a bits of hair, that the wasp of hair, of the wisp of hair, I mean, the, the yeah, the wisp of hair, that curl of hair of the end of the of the bull, that too you have to return. Frek Taisvas, Mimanov Shach says Taisvas, Rashi, what are you talking about? If it's Shove Pruta, then of course you have to return. If it's less than Shove Pruta, then you don't. Says Taisvas, listen to this. Says Taisvas, this is teaching me something completely different, and that is a whole other area of Halach of Shove Sabeda. Once the Aveda is in your hands, you have to maintain it. You have to take care of it. Says Taisvas, if you found a bull and now it's in your house, your, house will be, your, your, your wife will be very happy, right? Darling, I found a bull and now it's going to walk around the dining room. So nice. So, uh, yeah, it's a mitzvah. What do you mean? So now one of the things you have to do, yeah, you know, yeah, I don't know. So then what? One of the things you have to do is to maintain it. So you have to give it a haircut in the wrong, in the right time. When the time comes, you have to cut the hair even, even down to the back, to the, to the, to the end of the tail. That's what the Torah is telling you. That's what Shulchan Aruch says. You have to maintain the Aveda. If you find a bull and you find a place for it, you know, on your farm or something, then you, what do you do? You actually cut it and you give it a trim when necessary. And that's the Kiddush from Shor. That's what the Torah is telling you for the word Shor. And Beseh continues the Gemara like Gizoisov. And say you have to shear. You have to shear the sheep and you have to shear at the right time. And what do you do with the wool? You keep it to the guy for the guy. You keep it for the for the owner. You sell it and you keep him the money for him. Back to the Gemara, why do you need both? The licht of Rachmona show that filo ligizas is novoy. You tell me what's worth more, according to Rashi, or what needs more maintenance? The little bit of wisp of hair, the little curl of hair at the end of the donkey's uh, of the bull's tail, or the sheep's wool? Of course, the sheep's wool. So if the tur told me that even for the shore, for the tiny bit of tail that he has, I have to maintain or to return, according to Rashi, the kosher can sell a gizoisov. The tur doesn't have to talk about sheep. Because if I have to return slash maintain the teeny bit of, of 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 tail of the bull, of course the sheep's wool, which is always worth a lot of money in every culture, it's a valuable thing. Of course I have to return slash take care of. So what's the chiddush? Just write sure and don't write say. I would know it because the chomer, know it by kol shekin. Why do you need to mention both? Elamarove, here comes Rav with a strong statement. Rav comes here with a strong statement. Chamor de Bor le Rabbi Yuda. I'm going to explain that soon. The word Chamor, ah, Bovekama, Bovekama, here we come. Chamor, remember it says in the Torah, when it comes to Bor, the Nezek of a Bor in Oshu Sarabim, and you know what that means. It says, Vnofa le Shoma, Shor o Chamor. Shor beloy Odom, Chamor beloy Kalim, right? If a human being falls inside your potter, and if dishes fall inside, let's say somebody falls in with his porcelain is dead, you don't have to pay. You only have to pay for animals. Rabbi Yudha says, no, and we learn it from the word shor and chamor to exclude humans and exclude Caleb. That's classical Bovakama stuff. Rabbi Yudha, already in Dat Heyo Mudalef and later in Bovakama, argues and says, Heyo Mudbeis. What does it say? Heyo Mudbeis. He argues and he says, no. He says, no. The word, really, and Achinami, if somebody's Caleb fell into the pit, you have to pay for the Caleb. So according to Rabbi Yudha, why is the word chamor mentioned in the Torah regarding bar? We don't learn anything from that. So that's a question, Rabbi Yudha. What does that have to do with us? Next. The Seda Aveda Lidivre Hakol Kashia. Why did the Torah write the word se vis-a-vis Aveda? Well, we can learn the Kiddush from Shor. Is the Enochinami questionable according to everybody? And we have no answer. There are two words in the Torah, which according to Rova, have no explanation why they're needed. According to Rabbi Yudha, we don't know why the word Chamor is mentioned in a pit because he does not believe that word comes to exclude Kalim. He believes Kalim falling inside you are Chayv, Mr. Bow owner. And when it comes to say, according to everybody, there's no argument. Nobody knows, basically, says Rove, why the word say, the word sheep, why it appears in the Torah, the fourth example for Ashava Sabeda, we don't know. It's Kasha.
Oh, yeah, because we learned everything. Some simla, what did we learn? There has to be simonim and have to be toivim, right? Chamol, we learned that side accessories are also good enough as a simon like the saddle, right? Sho tells me that even the tiny, teeny bits of little pieces of Aveda you have to take care of or you have to return. But se, se, we remain speechless at that point. So says Rava, and Rava seems to be like, a, I would say happy, Rava came to a conclusion. But the Gemara is not happy. The Gemara is asking, maybe the word se comes to tell me that you even have to return the glolim. Unbelievable. The glolim are the feces. The feces, the excrement of the animals can be used. They can be used as a fertilizer. So let's say I got someone's animal, either se, sho, chamo, I don't know which one of them is better fertilizer, an elephant, whatever I found. Elephant. <laughs> what about that? The glolim, the feces have to keep, your wife will be even happier now. You keep the feces, you keep the excrement of the animal, that enhances your marriage very much, for the mitzvah, and you keep them in big box and give them back to who? To the owner. Maybe that's the chiddush. Maybe for that we need se, because glolim are worth less. I mean, as much as worth to fertilize, but not worth as much as the, as the tail, or the good maintenance and the trimming and the grooming of the animal. <laughs> Answers the Gemara, no, no, no. It doesn't come to tell me that. Glolim of kurim after lehu. We assume, says the Rashi, that Glolim, the owner, gives relinquishes his ownership, his mafkir, and he doesn't mind that the person, the finder who takes care of it, will use them to fertilize his own thing or any other use he has. I don't know. Says Rashi, why? You know why? Because he took care of it. In other words, I took care of your uh, Aveda, says the owner, not the owner says the finder to the owner, so at least let me use the glolim to fertilize my, 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 my field a little bit. Yeah. So that much people are not makpid, and the Torah endorses it. The Torah says, don't be such a geki don't be so you know, nitpicking, and the glolim at least allow the finder to use. So it doesn't come for that. Maybe it comes to tell me, maybe se comes to tell me that the Torah believes that simonim are good enough of a way, of a proof to get back your item. Everyone's going to ask, of course, we know that simonim are a, good, are a good sign, are a good way to get back your stuff. Says the Gemara, no, no, no. As I told you before, here comes the Gemara. The Bailan, we had a question about simonim. Simonim do raisa do abonon. Do we say that simonim are reliable enough are believable enough, credible enough, and valid midoraisa or only midorabonon? Let me explain. Let me explain. We all see throughout the parak, simonim, 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 simonim. Every half a word here is simonim. Every other word. Yes and no. Although Chazal believe, if I come to you and I lost my, uh, I don't know, I lost my uh, shoes, I lost my 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 thing, my USB cap. Yeah, I lost it and Alan found it. I'm giving you a simon. It's white with a red thing over here and inside, um, whatever. Yeah, I come to you and I give a good sim and you give it back to me. Nice, kita dalid. Says the Gemara, it's not so simple. It's true that it works, but does it work with the Oraisa? Does the Toyer believe that's good enough of a way to return as a proof? Or maybe the Toyer believes you need Adim. Maybe when I come to take it from Ellen's hands, maybe I would need to Adim. I would need two reliable people. I would need you and you. I need to Adim. To come and testify, like in other areas of halacha, yeah, like money, like other things, that it's mine. I, why did Rabbanon say that Simonim are good? Because Rabbanon has to base in Hetkel. When it comes to monetary issues, then Enechinami, Chazal can do whatever they want. Shet in Yubamas, in Gitin, in many places, Hetkel based in Hetkel. The mind of Kamina, the mind of Kamina, as we learned before, Gite Noshim. Ah, what would be if someone found a get of a woman? Don't worry, we're not going to go and get back to that complicated sugya. Conceptually, when one found the get and wants to give it back to the hands of the husband, let's say, the yeah, and he gives him simoni, but no aidim, then what? Then you're not playing with money, you're playing with eshes ish, with isurim. And if it's only with Dorabonon, if it's only valued in Dorabonon level, and not Doraisa level, who comes to eshes ish, chazal cannot be mekel. Only in money things it can be mekel and say, simonim are good enough. But if you say Simonim or Doraisa, the Torah is the one established that Simonim are good enough, then it's also good for Nashish. 
because it's the, the Torah decided it's good. That's the question. We know Simonim are good, but what is the level of the validity? Is it Doraisa? Would be good also for Eshetish forget or someone's dead husband? That's all other issue. Or is it only good Midorabanon? Oh, maybe here, maybe the answer lies right over here. Co continues the Gemara, line starts the Rabbanon. Kosev Rachmano Se, maybe the Torah wrote you the word Se, the full Besimani Madrina and Besimani Doraisa. Oh, maybe the Torah wrote you the extra word Se to tell me you should know that those Simonim are valid with Doraisa. Yeah? In other words, one would say maybe the Torah wants Edim. Maybe the Torah says, return, return, return this, return that. Maybe with a ukaf. We said before, a saddle is a good simon. Yeah, but maybe only with Edim. I don't know if simonim are good enough in the Torah's perspective. The Torah added an extra word, seh. Not that seh has to do with simonim more than any other item. It's just an extra word to emphasize and tell you, you don't only need Edim, even simonim are good enough on the Torah level. Maybe that's what the Torah had said. We're going to get to the two dots soon, and then you can ask questions. Amri says the Gemara, no. The Torah, if you remember, we saw, actually we saw in the Mishnah, when did the Mishnah speak about Simla vis-a-vis -vis Simonim? It says in the Mishnah, right? A Simla is unique in the fact that it has Simonim in it, and it also has Toivim people bought the Simla somewhere. It's not half It didn't come from the tree. I've called over Shesh Bosimonim, Vesh Latovim Chav Lachriz. Ah, so that business of Simonim is already taken. Hey, the job is taken, occupied. Who is the one who, that, which one is the one that teaches me Simonim? Simla. Not say. Shmaim and Odessa, lovely Simonim, who they also. Because we saw that Simla is mentioned with Simonim, must be that the Tana learned that said does not come for Simonim. He comes to tell me something else. What is the something else? We still don't know. We remain with Rova that sort of gave up, so to speak, and told us that we don't know why the word se when it comes to Aveda appears in the Torah. We're allowed to remain with questions. We have a question which we don't know. We don't know. As long as I don't lose my computer. Yeah. Okay. Rabbi, you want to ask something? No? Okay. Don Rabbanon or continue. Commercial, commercial. Beautiful, beautiful. Beautiful question of the rabbi. Why don't we say that the store owner, back to the Mishnah, should get a bikini and chotzer? Beautiful. Answer number one. Answer number one. Because the matzbeos, coins, if you see in archaeological digs, coins used to be much smaller and not so nice. So the coins, because he may possibly never find them, the shop back then was made out of sand. In other words, it wasn't tiled. And it was harder to find small coins in your untiled shop. And therefore, it's hard to find. And we said yesterday, something which you may never find in your house, you don't have Kenyan Chotzer. Second answer, because there are so many people coming in and out, it's not called Mishtameres, Chotzer Mishtameres. Chotzer is a place where I know where everything is and I'm the owner of my house. I spoke to a guy two nights ago who said, my house is like Tachna Merkazit, everyone runs around. A normal home, you know where everything is or you may find. A shop is frequented by so many foreigners, so many people from the outside, that vis-a-vis -vis this, it's not called Mishtameris, and that's why he's looking in Chotzer. And thank you for reminding me, because I wanted to say that. Beautiful. Viter, a few more lines. Yes? Hey, I saw it in the Rishonim. Oh, I'm so bad. I see him in the Rishonim, and I forget who says what. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I saw it inside in the Rishonim. I don't remember. Don Rabonon, my fault. One of my weak points. Don Rabonon. Asher Toivad. It says in the Torah, Asher Toivad, which means the Aveda that you lost. <laughs> this is an extra word, right? Of course, Aveda was lost, right? We don't repeat. Prat. So why did the Torah tell me that? Prat la Aveda she'en da Asher Toivad means it's an item that somebody lost. If it's less than Shveh Pruta, it's not called losing. Yeah? The Torah here tells me that although the, the if the item is not worth pruta, it's not called a loss. It has to be a real financial loss. You can have sentimental value for that little crumb, but it's not really worth anything. Rabiuda argues regarding the source, Oimer, why did the Torah tell me that I found it? Of course I found it. That's the whole story. Why do you have to tell me I found it? But la veda, shem pruta. Says Rabbi Yudah, exactly the same halacha, exactly the same halacha. 
He learns it from a different source. Why did the Torah tell me that you found it? You found it. You found something that's called a real finding that's worth a pruta, right? But something that's not worth a pruta, you don't have to return. What's the difference between Tanakama, who learned it from losing, and Rabbi Yuda, who learned it from the word finding? At the end of the day, they say the same thing. But the item has to be worth at least a pruta. There's no halachic difference between them. It's an academic difference between them. They just learned it from different places, from different drushes. My nafka the mashar toivad. One of them, Tanakama, learns the same halacha from the word that you lost has to be a loss. My nafka the mitzasa, and one learns it from mitzasa from that you found something. Lesson pruta is not called finding. It's not called. It's like below zero in the world of finances. Ta-da! Thank you very much, and we'll continue tomorrow. Tomorrow I have a chart for tomorrow's year. Atzlochem, we have a good Chodesh tomorrow, 9.25. You've been on Swish Chodesh. We stay at the same time. Atzlochem, we have a month full of physical and spiritual shefa. The rain should come down both physically and also spiritually to help us understand Hashem's holy words. Thank you very much.